All right. Welcome, everybody, to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Um, today, we have Shailene Rodriguez. Shailene is an artist, educator, writer, and community organizer based in the Bronx. Her practice utilizes text, drawing, painting, um, collage, and sculpture to depict spaces and subjects engaged in strategies of survival against erasure and subjugation. Just make a note, like the image that was on the, the thumbnail, so the like image you saw at the beginning of this or that you'll see if you check it out and watch the replay um, is a piece that she created. So I'll let her say maybe a little bit about that because it relates to the conversation. Uh, good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to say a few things up front. So one, there is a petition in the show description, and I'm asking everybody to check it out and to sign it. Um, Check out the conversation that's also in the show description with Jared Ball um, over on I Mix What I Like on Black Power Media, where um, Shailene goes through the whole ordeal in terms of dealing with, you know, far right activists, far right right wing media and their whole crazy ecosystem uh, echo chamber um, Zionists and of course capitulating universities right so that's like my one sentence summary of it all but please go watch it it's an incredible interview um a really great conversation and i just want to make sure that i just say up front that um you know i hope folks find as many ways to support shailene as they can whether that's through the petition whether it's figuring out ways to you know have her do an event or some art or whatever it is um you know because i think we need to find multiple ways to support folks who take principled stands against um you know the things that she has whether that's zionism you know uh whether that's um you know in this time of genocide obviously or whether that's um you know far right activists coming on campus and trying to indoctrinate folks with their propaganda um and so anyways, I just wanted to say that that up front before we get started. But Shailene, welcome to the show. It's good to have be in conversation with you. What's up, Jared? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. We've we've had a little bit of, you know, back and forth discussion about this. And um, I really enjoyed your piece, which I think is now. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I also linked that in the show description. If not, it is on. Um, my Twitter on the millennials are killing capitalism Twitter. Um, but anyways, it's, it's now available for free download, which is really cool. Um, because it is just for people who understand, um, anarchist review of books is a print like newspaper essentially is kind of the format that it comes out in. So, um, you know, it's a way that you can access it also digitally. Um, so anyway, um, the piece that we're going to talk about, it's called And You Don't Stop, The Assimilation of Hip-Hop, Hegemony, and the Empire State. Uh, that's a great description of the article itself. Um, let's just start at the beginning. So you're from the Bronx. Um, you write about the 50th anniversary of hip-hop, which is something that I have totally resisted watching, uh, talking about everything, because I'm just like, I feel so alienated from where the arc of hip hop, you know, I guess as somebody who, if I had, if I was telling that to myself 10, 20 years ago, you know, that would have seemed crazy to me that, you know, I would feel that way at this point, but I do. Um, and I think your article really actually identifies a lot of the reasons why, um, not necessarily fully as a discussion of hip hop, but as more of a discussion of of New York and kind of how do we get here where we are, um, where we have the so-called hip hop mayor, Eric Adams, um, and this 50th anniversary celebration and KRS-One, you know, thanking the hip hop mayor. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, go ahead, just start there. Yeah, so, bro, New York is like, oversaturated with like official celebrations of the 50th anniversary of hip hop, the so-called 50th anniversary of hip hop, because I know old heads like to argue about whether or not it's even 50 years. But um, yeah, like, you know, I did like an inventory in order to write this because I also like you, 
I couldn't do it. You know, I was like boycotting. I was bitter. You know, it just felt like an avalanche or something. Like, you know, it felt like something was getting taken from me. So I was very much abstaining from the whole thing. Um, and I had my own drama last year, so I could actually avoid it. Um, but some of the events included, like, a, like you know, there was a series of block parties in Brooklyn, Queens, in the Bronx. There was the Rock the Bells concert in Forest Hills that had um, acts like uh, LL Cool J, Swan Peppa, Queen Latifah, Mass Appeal, and Live Nation did the concert um, in uh, Yankee Stadium, which was like Run DMC, Lil Wayne, Snoop Dogg, Ice Cube, Lil Kim, the Sugar Hill Gang. I mean, like, it was really like, just like all out. Um, Adams also gave $5.5 million to that hip hop museum that they've been building in the Bronx, which is very contentious. Of course, you know, anytime a museum goes up, the people go out, you know what I'm saying? So, um, so yeah, all of this was going on, but like uh, beneath the surface, this really was Eric Adams' big COVID economic recovery plan, straight from the playbook of ABME or the Association of a Better for a Better New York. He even remade the I Love New York logo and spent twenty million dollars doing it, pissing everybody the fuck off because he ruined the original. Um, I should say what ABME is though. So, what is ABME? ABME is a political lobbying force created by New York City's ruling elites, composed of real estate finance and tourism interests. Uh, they created this shadow governing body, allegedly one of the first public private partnerships in the US to protect themselves and their money from the erupting poor and working class in New York who were dealing with how Ruthie Gilmore calls it, the organized violence and organized abandonment the ruling class invoked. And I'll say more about that in a minute, but just a little bit more about Abney. Abney helped create the idea of New York as the Big Apple and the I Love New York campaign that Eric Adams ruined. They also helped create the New York City Police Foundation, an independent nonprofit organization that provides resources for the NYPD. Now, on a small scale, they pay for shit like Crime Stoppers and those highly trained bomb sniffing dogs, but they also fund the International Liaison Program. Which is uh, which has like NYPD intelligence officers stationed across the globe. Um, the foundation also sponsors the Operation Century Conference hosted by the NYPD for hundreds of high-ranking law enforcement officials from agencies worldwide to the, discuss the quote-unquote uh, changing threat of terrorism. So you know, please peruse their website and see who's on their board. Is real fuck shit. But the irony about this whole ordeal to me was crazy when we look at the context that hip hop emerges in, hip hop was a cultural offensive as a response to the conditions imposed by this shadow governing body. So then how does hip hop then be, end up becoming the face of that campaign 50 years later, right? So um, I'll back up a little bit. Um, I said that people were facing organized violence and abandonment in New York. Now, what do I mean? So I'm gonna do a brief history lesson real quick. Um, um, the Black descendants of Jim Crow South, Puerto Ricans and West Indian people who created hip hop are facing the industrialization. So migrants coming up from Jim Crow South, as I'm calling it, and uh, Puerto Rico via Operation Bootstrap arrived to New York post-World War II to work assembly lines. But between 1965 and 73, New York loses 600,000 jobs, averaging 100,000 jobs annually between 70 and 75, right? 75 is the quote unquote year that hip hop begins, right? Vietnam War. So in 65, black Americans accounted for 25% of all combat deaths in Vietnam. In fact, while black men represented approximately 11% of the civilian population in 1967, they accounted for 16.3% of all draftees and 23% of all combat troops in Vietnam. So brothers who didn't return in a body bag came back with serious PST, uh, PTSD or opioid addictions. And of course, like, you know, neoliberalism, you know, this is like a big one, you know, so New York becomes a, a Petri dish for neoliberalism, which reorganizes the state <clears throat> to be driven by the market. 
privatizing everything under the sun. Abney, as one of the first public-private partnerships, makes sense in this like context, right? But it's not just Abney. It's also Nelson Rockefeller who held public office as governor of New York at the same time that his younger brother, David, was at the helm of Chase Manhattan Bank as CEO. Together, those motherfuckers sank New York into bankruptcy and then flipped it to the private sector, even using public sector worker pensions to bail the city out, essentially defanging the unions and make the state essentially function as administrators for the market. And it does this by implementing austerity so, uh, suffocating the people they rule over. And, you know, we're talking ra wage freezes, layoffs, transit fare hikes, the tuition imposed in CUNY for the first time, CUNY being the City University of New York system for those who are not from New York. Limits on rent control, cuts to welfare, you know, the whole ordeal, cut to public services. Um, <clears throat> this it don't sound like anything new probably in 2024, but you know, at the time that this is happening, it's like for the first time that we're seeing like the public, like, you know, the whole FDR, like new deal shit, like crash and burn, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, it's like, it, it, it's very, uh, it's very strong, you know? But anyway, when these policies uh, drastically reduce services and resources, it also, dis it, it also triggered disinvestment and redlining from these racists, you know? Uh, this coupled with the ongoing job loss from deindustrialization was a perfect storm. Landlords let their properties fall into disrepair and it becomes harder for tenants to pay. Landlords then start abandoning properties in mass, torching their buildings to collect fire insurance money, setting off an epidemic of arson across the city. Now, seven different census tracts in the Bronx lost more than 97% of their buildings to fire and abandonment between 1970 and 1980. It's hard for me to understand numbers like that. I'm not a numbers person, like I'm more of an image person. So if I say one track, one census tract is 640 acres, I could feel it a little bit more. Now I'm saying seven census tracts lost 97% of their housing that's 640 times seven acres, bro. You know what I'm saying? So then like 44 tracks out of 289 in the borough lost 50% of their housing. You kind of start to get what the picture looks like, you know? So then by 1980, the Bronx has surpassed Mississippi's poorest counties, becoming the poorest congressional district in the US. So we have massive unemployment, massive mental health and addiction problems coming in from returning vets, the abandonment of the state and the burning down of our neighborhoods by the landlords in a city full of, race, so full of racist police. Add to this now that our liberation movements responding to these blows are themselves under attack, right? So COINTELPRO, which I'm sure your viewers are familiar with, but you know, it's a series of covert and illegal uh, projects actively conducted by the FBI under the leadership of Hoover, you know, the surveilling, infiltrating, discrediting, disrupting, framing, assassination, political leaders and organization. Hip hop emerges as a cultural offensive amidst all of this. It's the only kind we could have, which was not a blow for blow with the state, but one was, you know, one that was, was like, to reinvigorate a people. In that sense, it was like abolitionist in principle and that it sought to remake our world when the work of dismantling our unfreedom was foreclosed on. So then the offensive was a cultural one. We made art. We challenged their billboards with top to bop whole car trains of graffiti. We danced on the streets. We held public space with park jams and took over abandoned buildings and made nightclubs or swatted and made homes. Hip hop was mutual aid. It was DIY. It was operating with the full understanding that we were abandoned by the state and have moved on and created something else. But as I say in the piece, some of us defected. There are many reasons why, many avenues, um, you know, the neoliberal character is born, the flashy 80s, capitalism marketing itself as sexy, and we go from an imported narcotics economy to mass incarceration, live on cops on TV in the blink of an eye. You know, so the motivation to write the piece for me was just like reflecting on all this history and seeing where we are now, you know, the complete capture of hip hop by the very entities we were resisting, although not fully, you know, not the spirit, and we could talk about that, you know.
Yeah, right on. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, getting us into it with that. Um, just a couple notes. One, Nelson Rockefeller, that reminds me to plug the tip of the spear study group. So I'll wait until the end of the conversation to do that. But uh, yeah, there she's got a copy. Um, Shout out to Ori, but, bro. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Ori. Always. Um, so, yeah. And it's funny, you know, even like thinking about um, Eric Adams, because, you know, it's like one of the things that kind of struck me too in him as this, you know, this, you know, hip hop mayor and a cop mayor, right, is like that, you know, in the 90s, there was this phenomenon, I'm sure you remember it, uh, that rappers used to talk about. Um, and by the 90s, I would say, especially once you're talking about mainstream hip hop, like, you know, things are captured, like, it's not as though I'm not trying to, uh, you know, I want to be clear, I'm not saying the 90s is like some utopian manifestation, what you're talking about really, is at the grassroots level, before things start to get, you know, as involved in commercialization and actually the the music industry, right? Um, but rappers would be talking about hip hop cops, right? And hip hop cops were not, um, you know, it wasn't like Eric Adams, right? Uh, it was the, uh, it was these, these counterinsurgency sort of forces that were assigned to rappers to, you know, jam them up for like, you know, weed. It's actually, I think, probably the origin of where the term weed carrier comes from, which I don't think people use anymore. But it used to mean like the guy in the entourage who might show up every once in a while on a record. But like his real purpose was there that like he holds the weed so that if they get busted, that that's the guy who takes the charge. Right. Um yep. And, uh, you know, and so like this was but this was very prominent. I mean, I think like, you know, all of the kind of conspiratorial questioning around Tupac and stuff like that, like part of why that stuff gets so shady is because it's true. There were like undercover cops that were assigned to rappers. There were agents, you know, and like it's interesting. I mean, even at a even on a cultural level of like even on a mainstream level, how anti police you know, hip hop always was as I was growing up. I mean, that was like the one thing that it was sort of consistent on no matter what, you know, whether you were talking about the most underground thing or the most mainstream act to some extent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, so it's just so fascinating to see, I think this level now where, you know, we have mayors, you know, and, you know, vice presidents or presidents. I mean, Obama, for instance, you know, like who, who kind of, you know does these playlist things you know and is always including like you know hip-hop acts and stuff like that in it right and so i guess to go back a little bit you know you're starting about talking about where it emerged and you've kind of laid some of that out the social conditions of the area the, the era the people who produced it mm -hmm. um and then you start to look at shifts over time and i think this is really interesting and where i want to go next is you know, um, these communities, right, who made up the groups who were doing the park jams and who were, you know, setting up their own parties outside, who were plugging, um, you know, their their turntables into, you know, stolen electricity from streetlights and things like this. Um, and, you know, their relationship to the state, right? Because obviously, as you're talking about it in the beginning, they're experiencing, as you say, you know, organized violence, organized abandonment. Um, and there's some important shifts that you highlight in, in the, in the piece in turn that, that bring them more into the orbit of the state. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I spent a lot of time in the piece talking about, uh, public sector jobs, you know, um, but I could write a whole other article on the role of the nonprofit industrial complex, but really Robert L. Allen already wrote that shit. And Dylan Rodriguez put a period on the end of the sentence with his uh, essay in the revolution will not be funded. But what I'm looking at essentially is like, what happens when some of us get jobs with benefits that we wanna protect versus the rest of us who don't. Uh, the kind of class separation that happens between us, even if we all live in the same hood and are part of the same family. So that can translate in Marx's terms of as like, you know, speaking as like uh, entry into the middle class. But I struggle to define it like that because I feel like it's a bounce between working class and middle class. And sometimes it's both, but not always. Um, 
but you know, like how how we perceive ourselves is important here. It's like I mentioned in the piece, bourgeois aspirations is a major characteristic uh, because those aspirations, as I say in the piece, aren't about fancy homes in the Hamptons or penthouse in Tribeca next to Jay-Z and Beyonce. You know what I'm saying? They're actually more along the lines of a house with a backyard and two cars in the driveway. It's suburban white flight aspiration. Now, if that is like uh, what the good life looks like for you coming from like generations that survived everything I just mentioned and the ones I didn't mention, like, you know, like the crack era, HIV AIDS crisis, then we're not just looking at ourselves collective, collectively as like Black or Puerto Rican or the fact that we are all from the Bronx, on the same street or from Flatbush or whatever. Um, those ways of, of seeing ourselves get overcome by like other kinds of groupings, you know, and this is what I'm like trying to get at in the piece. Like when I start to talk about, you know, you know, the people who, you know, the people who socially reproduce hip hop, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, I, I go on this tangent at some point where I'm like, you know, uh, Grand Wizard Theodore may have scratched the first record, but he needed his mama to come in to scold him. And he needed his mama to like actually give him a room to sleep in, you know, and Cool Herc needed people to actually care enough to come outside to party. You know what I'm saying? So like these people, these are the people that made hip hop you know, who we designate the pioneers are just, you know, catalysts to some degree. And I'm saying that as an artist, you know. Um, this is, uh, but you know, this is where the, the, the conversation around hegemony and thinking and thinking uh, about Gramsci by way of Uncle Stuart Hall uh, comes into play when he says, and I got quotes here, like, you know, the, the diversification of social antagonisms, the dispersal of power which occurs in societies where hegemony is not sustained exclusively through the enforced instrumentality of the state is grounded in the relations and institutions of civil society. The family, school, church, hood politics, ethnic nationalism, etc. For these white flight bourgeois aspirant folks among us, other relations and institutions of civil society become more prominent specifically which i'm trying to point at at the piece of law and order you know what i'm saying so like some of the numbers that i found when i was like doing my thing trying to write this article you know and i'm not like i'm not an academic and i kind of just figure it out i cosplay one you know um but you know i went on the nypd website and you know so what do we have we have black and latino people make up 90 percent of jail admissions but we but we are only 52 percent of the population. There are 17,045 civilians employed by NYPD. So like, you know, the clerical, the this, the that, whatever. 46.4% of those people are black. 22.6% are Latinx, right? It's working for the state, working for the pigs. Of the uniformed, 15%, 15 15.9% are black. Latinos double that number, 31.4%, you know? For the corrections, COBA, which is the union for the corrections officers and has a standing army of 20K active and retired members, 82% of which are black and Latino. So, you know, this is, this is why I kind of made that shift and why I kind of focused more on like public sector because, you know, um, you know, it's a problem. It's a problem for us on the ground. You know what I'm saying? Uh, generationally speaking, these are either my my parents' generation or my own. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's something that, you know, again, when you look at that shift you're talking about, right, of the period when people didn't have jobs and they're dealing with, you know, like you say, PTSD addiction coming out of vietnam you're dealing with deindustrialization right and you think about cities too and like what's available in terms of jobs you know i i'm in philly now you know and it's like yeah i mean you're either working in philly just to give us an example which is not as not as diverse and doesn't have as much capital in it as new york does at this point in terms of like major corporations and things like that but like in Philly, it's you either work for one of the big universities 
which are the largest employers in Philly, um, or you work for the city, you know, in some some capacity, you know, you're working for the city, working for the state, mm -hmm. um, you know, or you have a service job, right? Like that's the those are the those are the arenas, you know. I mean, you could be. I guess I left out. Well, I wouldn't leave that out. I mean, education, right, is is a public sector, you know, position too. When I was you in know, high school, you know, I like, you know, I got my GED in '96. When I was in high school, my mom saw I was like cutting school every day. She was like, drill me every day, take the civil service exam so you can get a city job, like, you know, uh, get a post office job. If you get a sanitation job, that was like lit because they make a lot of money. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's just like working class mentality is like, you know, get these government jobs because they have good pension plans blah 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 you know the the pension aspect is crazy i mean i remember a friend of mine when i was living in new york her father had i forget the year total that you have to have right but like he had worked like 20 25 years at i think septa right and then i'm mean, not septa sorry uh mta right and then he had done another 20 25 years like he he retired from that one and then got another city job so that he could get another pension and so he had by by that time he had worked for like 40 years or something like that and he had two pensions like the guy was he was so so set up right you know and it was like but yeah i mean as you're right in terms of that that was the pathway that was available too right like that's the other thing you know um so yeah there's that there's like the two those two things you're talking about right you have those kind of the bourgeois aspirations that are within hip-hop music which were always kind of you know at least as far as the recorded material and I refer you know, to that that is. cosplay because like it's not really what like you know we might buy the like you know the, the fake louis in canal street but like really like at the end of the day it's not really what the desire is you know the desire yeah. is actually very, like, very middle of the road, you know? Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. I That also reminds me of when I was in New York and you would always see rappers and they were just, like, working class people. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they were just regular folks. In, in This was in, I was there from 2005 until 2010, right? And so, like, you know. I would see Jada Kiss hop in the back of a Corolla or something like that, right? And like it was just sort of like, you know, it, it's such a such a stark distinction in the reality of the music video mm -hmm. versus the reality that people were living on the ground, you know. Um, yeah. So, I I did want to talk about colonialism and neo colonialism. Um, you know, I I used the term neo colonialism to describe it. And in part, that was like a characterization from, you know, others, but also, you know, after we had talked about it a little bit, that's kind of the term that came to mind. Um, but I think, you know, as I've thought about that more, you know, there's some reasonable ways, reasons for people to push back against that that term. Um, Sharice Bernstelli said to me once that, like, you can't talk about neocolonialism within the United States because it hasn't had a real process of decolonization, right? So, like, how do you talk about neocolonialism within a settler colony? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that's a great point. Um, obviously, I, I know where you're going to push back on it because we already talked about it, so I won't preempt that. But, um, you know, you talk in the piece about the sort of Eric Adams blueprint, um, like the the kind of way that now uh, the hip hop mayor is becoming, is getting exported, right, to, uh, you know, other cities. Um, mm -hmm. And... You know, also, you were recently um, back in Puerto Rico, I know, and um, at the same time as Kamala Harris was there. Um, and, you know, so I'm just interested in, one, your thoughts on the term neocolonialism, but also, like, some of the impacts of these developments overall um, for folks. Yeah, um, yeah, I already told Jared, everybody, that I don't like the word neocolonialism. I mean, what's neocolonialism to a Puerto Rican? We under U.S. occupation. Ain't shit neo about it, you know? You know, and I also was saying, like, you know, when we were talking before, like, you know, New York City is a Caribbean city. And we all migrate with a version of colonialism, be that British, 
you know, you know, shout out to like my, my Jamaican brothers and sisters or like, you know, Spanish or French. And we live under uh, colonial conditions inside the United States together. But I don't know what I gathered from your question when you sent me prior um, is that you were kind of pointing to the weaponization of black and brown people by the state. And in, in my piece, I talk about Adams and the dilemma of the NYPD that gets more and more black and Latino because I'm surrounded by cops in the Bronx. There's like three, there's like a corrections officer that lives below me, two cops on the, like on the third floor, another cop on the fifth floor. Like I'm surrounded by pigs. Um, I call them bi cops, which is like a flip on BIPOC because, yo. Know, it is what it is. But you know, this is the old move. And if you had Sharice, shout out to Sharice Bernard Stelly. If you had Sharice on here, I'm sure sis broke that shit down. You know, um, you know, we know how Cold War era black liberal leadership abandoned the anti-colonial struggle alongside Africans in order to unsuccessfully lobby Truman for reforms he ultimately wouldn't give. We know that they did this shit by advising the State Department on how to better hide the black American genocide in the world in order to help the U.S. establish influence in Africa and Asia, their contributions to the fight against communism. I'll never forget when I read this shit, uh, Adam Clayton Powell telling the State Department, quote, one dark face from the U.S. is of as much value as millions of dollars of economic aid to the third world. This is old. I mean, now we see Lloyd Austin, who is an iteration of like, Colin Powell, Condoleezza, Obama, Sotomayor. It's, it's old news, but what, what's more crucial for us, I think, is on the state level. And what seems to me to be a response to Black Lives Matter, that now the ass whippings from pigs are coming from, like, you know, they're under the jurisdiction of, like, former cops turned mayors like Ar Adams and Lori Lightfoot or black police commissioners in San Francisco and Houston and Columbus, Ohio, and how this pairs up with the avalanche of cop cities that we are facing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we've had our own, Philly, we have our own rounds of this too, um, the current mayor, but also the, the police chief who, I don't know who the current one is, but the one who resigned recently uh, was a black woman. Um, and, um, so let's talk about the the organizing implications of this. And I want to say before we get into that, like I welcome folks in the chat to engage, to, to drop your questions too. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, but, you know, that's one of the things I appreciate in terms of you laying all this out in the piece as you do. And then, you know, you and I had talked a little bit about this too. Um, I know that you organize, you're in the Bronx. And I'm wondering the ways that you think about like how this shapes the terrain, right? Because obviously you're you're highlighting a lot of contradictions that complicate a way that people would traditionally maybe think about organizing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, yeah, what are some of the ways you seek to move, kind of given these right realities on the ground? <sighs> this is exhausting, you know. Um, I mean, like, you know, the work is, is like, it's a fucking task, you know? Um, we have to disrupt the presence of cops in every space, obviously. Um, and I'm saying that because, you know, that feels like the, that feels like the, the biggest dilemma from, from where I'm sitting, from my positionality, knowing where my people um, sit in the situation. Um, you know, so like, you know, especially in schools where they're doing a lot of the recruiting. Um, and to some degree, I feel like, you know, they're doing it to themselves. Like here in New York, cops are like fucking bed bugs. They're like everywhere and people are over them. But young people are seeing this as an avenue to get a good job, much like how my generation joined the army. So we have to like make being a cop a taboo. Uh, we have to disrupt the archetype of the white cop and address the bi cop dilemma. Uh, we spend so much time on the white pigs that we miss the counter strategy that they used against us. And this is our fault. It isn't enough to focus on race. It always needs to include class and an anti-colonial uh, analysis. Like, you know, as I say in the piece, like capitalism is always poised to employ one half of us to humiliate, humiliate, hunt, beat, arrest, and kill the other half. Um, 
I closed that piece talking about the radio through Fanon and you know Radio Algiers voices uh, versus uh, the voice of fighting Algeria. <clears throat> this is essentially like me wanting to think about how to seize the narrative. I like what Uncle Stewart says about it. Um, he says, and I wrote it down. Um, Hegemony is a very particular, historically specific and, ter and temporary moment in the life of a society. It is rare for this degree of unity to be achieved, enabling a society to set itself a quite new historical agenda under the leadership of a specific formation or constellation of social forces. Such periods of settlement are unlikely to persist forever. There's nothing automatic about them. They have to be actively constructive and positively maintained. Crisis marks the beginning of their disintegration. Second, we must take note of the multi-dimensional, multi-arena character of hegemony. It cannot be constructed or sustained on one front of struggle alone, for example, the economic. It represents a degree of mastery over a whole series of different positions at once. Mastery is not simply imposed or dominative in character effectively. It results from winning a substantial degree of popular consent. And I think this is the thing. New York City is the empire of the empire and we are its periphery. The internal colonies on its peripheries. Waves and waves of people at different levels of understanding about where we are. But at least we can know why we are and <clears throat> try to begin from there. You know, for me, that means a constant reweaving of the social fabric. My generation now, we either the bureaucrats or guards for the jails or we locked up in it. But what about, you know, the people who encompass New York now, all these migrants and folks from Mexico, from Bangladesh, from Senegal, Mauritania, Guatemala, Venezuela, how do we organize them to help construct the narrative on why we are here before the American flag waving propaganda becomes the default, which always means hostility to the black and Latino people who are already here that will be looked at as lazy and unwilling to work. One thing we do is like, you know, popular education. So like, you know, we like, you know, I have a small globe cadre with, which I work with. And like some of the stuff we do is like, uh, we have a zine called Inigrante Malagradecido and it, it comes with a teaching. And, you know, that means ungrateful my immigrant, the ungrateful immigrant. And, you know, uh, essentially the conversation is, it's like, um, we, there is no reason for us to feel grateful for being inside the United States because we are following the warmth of our resources. The places that we come from, we want to be home. You know what I'm saying? Like, I should... I should not, I should be speaking Spanish living in Puerto Rico. And I mean, like we can dial that shit back more and more, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, why am I here? Why are you here? Something triggered our migration to have to be here. We want to be somewhere else. And that thing is triggered by, you know, like, you know, mining, uh, you know, like extraction, war, you know? And ultimately the like, you know, the ultimate resource, which is like human labor, disposable human labor. You know what I'm saying? So like uh, helping to sort of like recalibrate the thinking about why we are here and like how we don't like there's actually reparations. We came back to get what belongs to us. We have to get it here because this is where it was hoarded, you know, so sort of like recalibrating the thinking with my alongside migrants to like that way of thinking about why they're here versus like the propaganda bullshit. And then the flip that on the other end is how do we build a consciousness for descendants of Jim Crow South that reverses the anti-immigrant sentiment becoming so prevalent? Cause like folks really, you really feel that shit and it's really disturbing, man. You know, like I was sitting, I was sitting in a restaurant like eating at the bar and there's this woman who like could have been my auntie and she was just going in all these immigrants are going to come here and just get on welfare. And I'm like, bro, they used to say that about us. And now you're saying that shit. You see what I'm saying? So it's just like, it's like cannibalistic. I don't know. So like, how do we build a consciousness for descendants of Jim Crow South that reverses that shit? You know, every black person in New York got a grandparent or a great grandparent from down South who migrated fleeing conditions. That's a refugee story. So if we, you know, so then what if we 
represented narratives around Jim Crow migration that brought people closer to understanding and empathizing with and seeing themselves through other migrants too. You see what I'm saying? So how do we make people meet each other halfway and want to struggle for their freedom? How do we begin to see each other? I don't know. How do we undermine and disrupt? It's it's a, it's a, it's going to take all of us. It's a, it's a lot of front lines. You know, it's, it's, we need a swarm of killer bees. This is a Wu Tang reference. This is about hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Um, so oh, I had something, but let me, well, let me back up a bit. So I don't know. You've you've shared some stories with me, and I don't know which ones. I'm I'm gonna put you on the spot anyway. But um, but. So tell talk a little bit like because one of the things that you talked to me about was um you know that you know like I I can't remember if it was Cabral I can't remember but you were talking about having having some you know a zine whatever right and and having um a figure right that obviously to those of us on the left has a certain resonance but like also like what resident resonance does it have to people who are from that place and have experienced the you know possibility of revolution perhaps right but then have also experienced the the counter revolution and the sort of defeat and now they're here and right like part it it mm -hmm. speaks to part of what you're talking about right now you know in terms of like why are they here right which is in, right. which is a whole story that is often I mean, uh, certainly in our in mainstream media, there's no allowance for discussion of that. Right. It's just yeah. there's people at the border like that's the you know. And so, yeah. Um, but yeah, go ahead. If you want to share some of that. I'm trying to remember what we were talking about, but I think I, I know. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Just. Um, for me, what 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 that thought triggers, what like, you know, is. Probably conversations about like the dilemma of like, you know, the influx of like migrants from Venezuela and, you know, how the United States is like doing this thing where they're like fleeing communism, you know, and like, you know, the, the irony that is like, you know, communists and anarchists and everything in between that, you know, who are doing a lot of mutual aid and support work, you know, I think, you know, <clears throat> You know, underneath the state is the people. Underneath the people is the land. And I don't know, like, you know, for me, I feel like the approach is to like, you know, just get people to see the thing materially, you know? Like we don't have to have that debate right now. I think, I think we all can agree that the state is fucked. Whether or not you want to recapture the state if you're like that kind of communist you know is like sure you know at some point that becomes a political discussion but i don't think that that's very necessary on the ground right now you see what i'm saying like uh how do we bring these people into the fold understanding that they're fleeing a condition right so that they don't get weaponized and turn into a, a gusano voting block down the road against us. You see what I'm saying? So it's just it's just one kind of dilemma that we have to face. And you know, that is not easy. You know what I'm saying? But we have to sort of like just meet people where they at. I yeah, I hear you. And I think that like that piece I think is really important because also like I'm from Southern Oregon and I lived there again for a period of my life, five years or so. I don't know, back before 2017. So what? That's seven years ago or something like that. At this point, times not you know. Um, but when I went back there, like one of the things that was interesting was like it was a much higher percentage of migrant community in the area than there had been when I was growing up. But it was always there because it, there's an agricultural community of of sorts right um and so like that's that's the labor right um and the uh you know all of their media was like right-wing dominated 
right? Right wing controlled, like not, you know, not saying this is like an organic phenomenon, it, it, meaning that the right was very clear that like they needed to um, politicize migrants in a certain way, even as they're anti-migrant. <laughs> yeah, they do it through you know? the church. They do it through the evangelical movement, the Christian Zionist movement. That's how they do it, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think that that's absolutely right. And I think that um, I appreciate your your work to, you know, think about different ways to combat this through, you know, media, through political education um, and so on. Um, Alex also lifted up something that I uh, um, wanted to share. This is my friend Alex Villopando, but he talked about being he's a regular regular ish guest on some local big church channel whose audience is generally working class, poor immigrant folks, Spanish language. Um, the only show on the network that is secular. And it's a place where I've gotten to talk about gentrification, intra-ethnic racism and police terror. And so I think that's another cool example of trying to do that kind of work. Yeah, I remember, um, you know, like not even that long ago, a few years ago, I was a lot more zealous, a lot more like, oh, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you start to age and you start to calm the fuck down a little bit, you know. I would never think about going inside of a church, you know what I'm saying? Because, like, I got I got problems with that evangelical shit for obvious reasons, right? But, like, um, I just think that, like, it, it's, like, all of the spaces need to be hit. You can't leave nobody out, you know what I'm saying? Um, this is not me trying to, like... You know, I'm not I'm not into the like, you know, reform shit. You know what I'm saying? That's not that. I'm not trying to like bend my politic to their shit, but I just we need to engage with everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like who's not down is not gonna be down. And we're gonna see it. And then so like then they on the other side of the line. But like a place like New York that is just like so like it's like it's like the sea like there's just so many of everything and moving at different times and spaces you know like so then like we really need to like think about all of the ways all of the channels all of the registers all of the scales uh, including talking to the church people you know what i'm saying like all right so then that means we got to do this this like you know liberation theology shit fuck it let's go like, what did Jesus say about liberation? Like, you know, like Jesus is a Palestinian, bro, anti-communist, um, communist, bro. You know, say like, how, 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 how can we re, how can we retell the narrative in a way that's that brings it back to us? You know, because like we talking about, like, you know, the whole shit is like capturing the hegemony, right? That was the whole shit, you know. And like, you know, you had sent me a question, um, one of the questions that you sent me that like you know we didn't really get to touch on was like this uh question that you were asking me about like the relationship between uh hip-hop and hegemony yeah go for it i i thought you kind of touched on it so that's why i brushed over but but go go ahead well you know like <clears throat> what is this idea like what the civil society is and that's why i'm like talking about like the sea i'm thinking about the sea like you know the coral and the jellyfish and all the whatever, you know, whatever, you get the point. But like, you know, it was just like a multitude, you know, and like, uh, this is like where we meet each other. It's like how we, like the black Puerto Ricans and the Caribbeans, you know, come together alongside, you know, those Italians, shout out to D-Ray, um, Irish and Jewish white flight New Yorkers. Like, you know, it's how we like start to form a, a, a civil society. Like, you know, um, I think about like, yo like how we say yo all the time and i think like yo is just like a inverted oi yiddish oi you know or like uh how um you know my grandfather when he got here in 53 he worked for an old jewish guy taught him english taught him the electrician trade you know what i'm saying and so then like so then like to some like so i have a theory that like like the new yorkian accent is like almost like a like a like a like a old jew but with a little bit of a latin flavor you know what i'm saying because we learned english 
because we lived in their neighborhoods, you know what I'm saying? But whatever, like how we clash and coincide to create culture, you know, which becomes what Stuart talks about when he says like the grounded terrain practices, representations, languages, and customs of any specific historical society, whatever. Ours being the one I had just described, what we live through, what we create, what we come from. But like when Gramsci says, it's important that I say this shit. When Gramsci says civil society, he means the public sphere where ideas and beliefs are shaped and the hegemony of the ruling class is reproduced in cultural life through the media, universities, and religious institutions to manufacture consent and legitimacy. So how does that shit show up in hip hop? And you and I were talking about this shit before the show started. Yasin Bey told us uh, when he was back when he was most deaf in the opening monologue of Black on Both Sides at hip hop, uh, like, you know, whatever happened in hip hop is gonna be what's happening to us, right? And I find this shit to be true, right? So the golden era of hip hop, all those dookie chains, that was during the height of the imported narcotics economy. And we felt that shit get dark. Too short in the ghetto brothers rapping about crack addiction in the family and the unsettled conscience of someone who's in the game. This is a soundtrack of my childhood experiencing the crack addiction of my parents. We battled it out for consciousness in the black power era in hip hop, ex-clan and poor righteous teachers. And that's occurring alongside, you know, a generation identifying with the struggles against South, South African apartheid in the 90, 1994 crime bill. So you got that gangster shit going with the lyricist, like with the lyricist conscious shit going at the same time for a minute there. It's a complexity of a situation where I thought like Wu-Tang really personified both sides of that shit. And then we get Bad Boy and Sean Puffy Combs come out and fucking ruin everything. That player hater archetype was nothing but like the same tired narrative of like the bourgeoisie and ruling class justifying itself and you know at the expense of poor and working class people as a as a propaganda to silence critique but we drank that fucking kool-aid and everyone wanted to personify the rich you know wholesale embrace capitalism and consumerism we got stuck there and you know what are the what are the hallmarks what are the hallmarks Corleone, Escobar, Kingpin, CEO, bullshit, the Black Bill Gates. This is the spirit of the thing, right? And we're submerged into the hegemony of the capitalist ruling class. We take on its characteristics and it shows up in hip hop. You know, I'm out for presidents to represent me, you know? Uh, but, you know, we also take on each other's characteristics. And this is the point I'm trying to make right here. You know what I'm saying? We take on each other's characteristics, forming like this national popular culture with which functions under the hegemonic logic of the ruling class. So in the piece, I give examples like Yankee, the, the Yankee fitted in the Brooklyn Nets, the dollar slice of pizza, Rockefeller Christmas tree, the spectacle of Times Square, Frank, Frank Sinatra and Jay-Z, Green Beer on St. Patrick's Day, Salsa music at Orchard Beach, and even my favorite, the cyclone in Coney Island, you know what I'm saying? Or a citywide celebration of the hip, like 50 year anniversary of hip hop. And then again, you know, you hear, you hear Gramsci in your fucking ear, the ideas and beliefs shaped by the hegemony of the ruling class reproduced in cultural life through the media, et cetera, to manufacture consent and legitimacy. But it's also the collective anti-immigrant shit and the love of police and law and order. And all of these attributes are collected and spit out to the masses via the daily news and the New York Post, the only newspapers literally available around the way. Shout out to the Block Times. And have you seen the news lately? It's all uniform, it's all univocal, it's all fascist. This is the shit that we got to fight. So like, you know, as an artist, you know, as a person like, you know, who thinks through culture, you know, like, that's a that's a battleground that I see. Like, you know, it's about like, of course, you know, organizing like like for the last, you know, however many years, you know, like we've tried everything, like, you know, the gentrification fight, we've tried like, you know, uh organizing tenants, you know, you know, like including in my the building that I grew up in, which was a section eight building, you know, like which you try everything, you know, but like like. For me, I gotta dial that shit back and think about like, yo, like we need to raise consciousness. Like this is like the battle right here is like that. Like my sister, I talked to my sister on the phone 
She telling me shit that she saw on like what's that app called Citizen app? Oh, you saw somebody got stabbed on Citizen app, blah blah. blah. You know what I'm saying? Or like sending me like crazy shit from News 12 The Bronx, which is also News 12 Brooklyn, which is also, you know what I'm saying? It's like a constant feeding of the thing. So like, you know, to take it back to like that long ass quote I read to you from Stuart about like, yo, how do we capture the hegemony when the shit is disintegrating? Because we are like Palestine is breaking down all of this shit right now. Palestine is freeing us. I've heard that shit said and it's like, I believe it to be true. Is breaking down all of that shit. We are watching the disintegration of their hegemony right now. So for me, the front line, like, you know, at least where I can use my power, the little bit of power that I do have, you know, as a as a willing and able bodied person, you know, you know, with a certain kind of faculty, is like is to try to build consciousness, uh, not through art. But art becomes a tool, you know, because like the ability to like uh, make image this like, you know, like uh, di like put information out, you know, distribute information, like to try to like, like challenge the consciousness. You know what I'm saying? So like in the piece, and I'm sorry, I'm like on a tangent right now, but like in the piece, um, you know, I talk about WBAI, which is like a radio, like, you know, like how in the, you know, um, how like Eric Adams fucking has his own radio show. And this is like a, a a station that is like, you know, like geared to, you know, it's like the older, like it's like they play R and B from the eighties and nineties and like old school hip hop, you know what I'm saying? It's like that generation. And that's literally like the people that we're talking, that I'm talking about in this piece. They have a captive audience with Al Sharpton, Eric Adams, you know what I'm saying? They have like religious shit. So like, you know, what happens if like, we start to seize those spaces, right? Or we, we start to salt those unions. You know what I'm saying? Like, like all, like, and this is what I mean. It's like, it's gotta have, like, you gotta hit it in all of the places. For me, in that particular piece, you know, like, I, cause I'm like, I'm trying to be everywhere all the fucking time, which is probably not the best thing, but you know, like for me, like it's close to home because like, that's, you know, my generation and my people specifically, but you know, like, but I live in a neighborhood full of like, you know, like my neighborhood is predominantly Mexican and Bangladeshi and Dominican. You know what I'm saying? So like a bitch is out here like, my mom is way or salam, do me come a lot. So like, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to talk to my neighbors and I'm trying to like see them where they're at. And I'm trying to understand like what, what they left behind and how that shit mirrors you know, or how we can see each other, what see what we all left behind and what we can gather here together, you know? It's vague. I know I'm speaking kind of like in a kind of abstract right now, but you know, it, it can become material. No, I appreciate that all. And um, as folks said, you know, pop off, feel free to go on any tangents or or rants. They're all welcome. And I'm sorry that I missed that question initially because it would have been, I mean, it was a great response and I appreciate it. I wasn't going to um, let you it out, bro. <laughs> what's that? I wasn't going to let you, you it out. <laughs> well, thank you. A um, uh, couple things. So this was the, I think this is the current chief of police in Philly. Um, thank you, Sterling. Uh, and then... Yeah, Alex said that uh, Mayor Adams is the logical conclusion of shit like New York Undercover and Ice-T on them pig shows. And yep. we'd say LL Cool J and Ice Cube and yeah, all and of actually, them. When um, I was a teenager, we would call like plainclothes cops that were black and brown, we would call them 21 Jump Street. Like, oh shit, 21 Jump Street is in the, is in the station. That shit is like now the norm. Yeah. I remember that too. I'm dating myself with the 21 Jump Street shit, but it's fine. <laughs> <Google> um, it. <laughs> let's see what else. So, so Alex asked, "How do we best combat the internalized pro-police narratives in our communities?" What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, man, that's that's the battleground right there. You know, like. I don't fucking know that have the answer. Like how I try to do it, you know, is like, you know, we have to like remember. We have to remember like people who are pro-police used to not be pro-police. 
And what are they responding to? Like, yo, like you were saying that shit, like Jerry, you were saying, like, I remember that was like, even in the lyrics that you hear, like, like in that, like late nineties, cause the nineties is like many different layers. Like 90 and 91 is nothing like what 92, 93 was nothing like what 94 to 97 was. And then like, we lost it after 97. It was just like, you know what I'm saying? But I remember in the lyrics of the shit, like people talking about like these fucking cops, the haters, like they them referring to cops as haters is like, you know, cause you ain't making no fucking money. Blah, blah. And it was like this kind of a thing that cops used to like actually like off duty cops used to like jokes and rob rappers and shit. You know what I'm saying? And now all of a sudden, like they just hired them all. No, that's my security team now. You know what I'm saying? It's just like a weird mix. And like, you know, God bless fucking Tupac because he kept it clear on what the shit was to a degree. You know what I'm saying? But like, I think that we need to remember, you know, the history, like, you know, bring that memory back for folks. And also like, why do people love cops? Because they're afraid of each other because they've become the middleman. Like, like, they are the middleman. If my neighbor plays like loud music and I'm like fucking over it, I'm gonna talk to my neighbor. But most people just call the cops on each other. Like they have been, the state has fucking wedged the need for police in every aspect of our lives. And we need to start to remove that shit. And that just means like bringing people closer together. Like we can't keep being afraid of each other. Grandma keep, can't can't keep calling the cops on the teenagers because they got tattoos on their face. You know what I'm saying? But also like, bro, help her carry her shit up the stairs if the elevator's broken. Like, it's about the re, re it's like rendering the police obsolete. You know what I'm saying? Um, and challenging the fear thing because fear. This is what I'm saying. Like I was talking about like News 12 and like New York Post, like. Like all this shit, like is this is like the what they do is a constantly like shoveling shit in your face to make you fear, 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 fear. And it's really us afraid of us so that we become isolated and we can't come together. You know what I'm saying? So like I think I think it's that, like, you know, and I keep bringing it back to like, you know, we just gotta talk to each other and we gotta like organize where the fuck you are. You know what I'm saying? Like if there's one person in, in one on a block, if there's one person on one block that like understands this shit, then like that's their job. That block is their job. You know what I'm saying? It's wishful I do. to some degree, no. but like, yo, soldier the fuck up. Right on. Um, I uh, So one of the things... And I don't know how much you want to go into this, but I, I appreciated when we talked before a little bit of discussion we had about some of the contradictions that come up with students in organizing spaces. And this is a contradiction. I mean, partly just because students, I mean, it depends where the students are from, right? But a lot of times students are not from the place where they're at, right? And so, and then a lot of times they have you know, they've had access to certain politics, certain narratives, et cetera, that like may or may not resonate with people that are where they are. So how do you think about that? Because like what you're describing and have described throughout this is really community organizing. You're really talking about organizing within your own communities. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously also like our movements, students are a big force within mobilizations, within um, and, and also do important work in their own universities to organize in those spaces, too. Like, I'm not this is not a an anti student discussion. It's just sort of like there are certain contradictions there that come up. Um, and I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. I would love to. I got so much to say about it. Go for it. Because, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I'm I'm where I'm at, like, you know, like, but I'm also a professor. And I love students and I and I teach in, and I'm in New York City, which is like literally like, bro the college industrial complex. Like literally students are the reason why like we have a gentrification problem. It's not their fault, but it's just like the restructuring of New York as a college town that turned literally all our housing into dorms and now Airbnb, but whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, so um, 
like I understand both sides. I think students are super important to what, you know, here's what I want to say. There's two sides of it. On one end, um, I'm going to talk about the pros and then I'm going to talk about the cons. Um, in a place like New York where Wall Street is, it's it's a it's like a split understanding of what itself, what it is to itself, right? On one end, it it like pretends to be a city that takes care of a city pe like people that live there. On the other end, it's also a stage for the world because it's where Wall Street is. It's all of these things, right? So it's like a dual responsibility where it's like pretending to do one by really just like holding a space for capital. It's just really what it's fucking doing, right? That means that there is so like, you know, New York is like one of these places where you like, you know, when like activists say, uh, think globally, act locally, New York is very unique in that you can think globally and act globally too, right? So I just said, about five minutes ago that like, I'm trying to think about my neighbors, where they come from and how that connects to what we can do here together. But New York is a place where like, for example, right now in Ecuador, uh, you know, El Conai, which is like the Confederation of Nationalities of Indigenous, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, they are literally battling against Atico Mining, which is a company from Vancouver. And they have with them, like, you know, the the president right now, Noboa, is like a fucking right wing monster. And he's sitting on massive aid that came from military, mili like a militarized police force that came from like the Trump administration. So like for the first time in Ecuador, we're really seeing a robust militarized police force that was not really something that people faced before. You see what I'm saying? So like now, and I'm just using Ecuador as an example, right? So now you have a bunch of Ecuadorians in New York who are like, you know, there's a massive, like there's a big, you know, diaspora here. So like a diaspora here can actually go to the Canadian consulate as they're battling it out there, go to the Canadian consulate, can like call up maybe comrades in Vancouver and say Vancouver pop off at the mining thing. And we could extend and expand our reach. Why? Because we're here. Any, any like all of these like multinational corporations, weapons manufacturers, whatever the fuck, they all got an office in New York. We could touch it here. So then like students, they play a role in that. They, they develop like an understanding, they get consciousness and, you know, like the, actually it's their obligation to take what they learn in the classroom and bring it out into the streets. So we want students down in Wall Street agitating. We wanted to occupy Wall Street. We needed that. You see what I'm saying? Because like, you know, we might be battling it out like Rebney on a state level, like, you know, trying to fight for like, like fight landlords and shit. But you know, like, how does that, like, how does the micro and the macro connect? We need to hit it on all the scales. So like students are like, you know, it's good in that, in, in that regard, you know, and I, and I know like the Bronx has been able to sort of like bob and weave massive gentrification, like what has happened to Brooklyn. Brooklyn is like now the cultural capital of, the, you know, the, of the country or whatever, whatever the fuck, you know what I'm saying? So like, uh, gentrification is like 10 years ahead of us and it's students, a lot of students, you know what I'm saying? So then it's like, you know, like you see like, uh, uh, like, you know, I, I can't remember the Brooklyn anti-gentrification defense or something like that. You see like all of these crews that like are, you know, formal, like, you know, students or former students who stuck around sort of like merge into what that body is because it's already like, you know, it has already fossilized into like a thing. So they are, they form a, a part of the body of the civil society of Brooklyn. And so then you see like, you know, they were able to like maybe withstand some of the ass whippings that the Bronx received in 2020 during the George, 
George Floyd uprising because we don't have like that. We don't like it. It's not robust over here the way it is over there. We're still very much like just like pushing that fucking boulder to like build a kind of consciousness here. You know what I'm saying? Um, on the flip side now, you know, we have to be careful with arrogance. We have to be careful with arrogance. We have to be careful with like, you know, um, knowing like I know better because I'm educated type shit. You know what I'm saying? And that happens to come into the spaces and not so much through students, but through, you know, nonprofit, the nonprofit industrial complex is like the third largest employer in New York City, right? So then like you have like people who are employed at nonprofits who do work for like, I don't know, like, you know, unhoused queer folks. And, you know, they feel really radicalized by the work that they're doing. And, you know, now all of a sudden they're fucking Che Guevara and, you know, they come into organizing spaces with shit that I call like whiteboard organizing thinking, you know what I'm saying? And like impose. You know, and like, um, and you know, there's also like the zealousness of like just being young, and, you know, and expecting a purity of politics and like not meeting people where they're at. And, you know, like perhaps that sometimes gets into the way of like the self determination of a people who are grassroots trying to figure it out, who are going to be rife with contradiction. Remember, I'm saying like, you know, we're dealing with people who are like, probably got cops in their family now you know what i'm saying like or like you know people who are like like who got a who got a co son and a son locked up in the jail that the co work in you know what i'm saying like this kind of shit so it's like um it's 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 a it's a it, it, it's a double-edged sword but i don't think you know i used to be more grumpy about it i'm less grumpy about it these days because you know i just see that there's there's possibilities if we could calm the fuck down and see each other in a certain kind of way you know what i'm saying and like not disparage like you know i know that there's critique of like marches and like the fact that you know oh it's like a bunch of students da, 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 you know but you know it's useful because <clears throat> it's not the only thing it's one thing in a toolbox right it's like the toolbox has a lot of shit and there are many things that they're useful for on different, like, you know, this is good for that. This is good for that. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like in the space of like, you know, holding public space, like, you know, like, like continuous marches, bringing people into public space. So much happens in that. So much happens in that public space. You know, like the social is actually good. You know, the fact that I know so many young people who got politicized because they were coming out to marches and shit and just holding a fucking banner. And that taught them that they could come out and do such a thing. It teaches audacity. They pick up language. They pick up, you know, oh, I need to learn about this. Oh, I, you know what I'm saying? It's just a, it's a, it's a, it creates a space for possibility for more further politicizing, good or bad. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like further, further politicizing and to like, lead to the next thing you know and we want we want as many possibilities for that we need as many possibilities as we can get because the monster is real yo the machine is real you know yeah absolutely shout out the gang good to see you um uh so it, all right i got some questions from the audience i'm going to pull in so Yipper99 asks, uh, does your family have the same mindset or similar to yours, or are they liberal? If liberal, how do you bring them to the left um, and not in a gridlock at every direction? Question continue. I have a family that are avid Steve Colbert watchers. <laughs> My family doesn't know who the fuck Steve Colbert is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, like, you know, I, like, I, I can't even think about my family in terms of left or right, you know, like they just, you know, like my mom was like, I remember a couple years ago, it was like vote, right? It was like uh, voting, whatever. And like picked up my mom in the whip and like in my girl's whip or whatever. And she's like, oh, I'm going to go vote. I'm like, who are you going to vote for, mom? Democrats. I'm like, which Democrats? She's like, I don't know, whatever, you know, they don't, she don't, they don't fucking know, 
You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just like a go along with the shit kind of a thing. And so like, for me, like I find small successes in like just raising consciousness, right? So then like um, when the whole, when, when the Al-Aqsa flood popped off, you know what I'm saying? With those valiant Palestinian resistors, um, my sister knew, cause it's like, you know, with time they understand like, you know, who I am in the family. They had no choice. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like we were in the fucking New York Post a million times, but um, you know, my sister like uh calls me, she's like, What's going on over there? Cause everybody's putting up the Israel flag. And I'm like, I'm glad that you asked. So then I gotta break down to her like Palestinian resistance, right? And so she's like, Well, I got one friend, this New York, so you know, we got spicy whites. So, like, you know, she's like, My my Albanian friend. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, she she's the only one that put up that put up like the Palestine flag because like they Muslim or whatever. Right? And then over time, I keep checking back in with her, and she's like, "Yo, nobody's putting up that Israel shit no more. Not everybody's talking about Palestine. That's crazy. What's going on over there?" So you know, it's like it's small ways. Like I remember a few years ago, like you know, uh, oh God, there's a police like. Shaleen, Shaleen, gonna pop off because there's a cop, blah blah blah. Because like somebody bought their boyfriend to the to like the barbecue and he was like an MTA cop or whatever. She's like, he's an MTA cop, but don't say nothing, blah 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 blah. You know what I'm saying? Like so, it's like treating me like that. Like I'm like gonna be the one, like get crazy and shit, you know. But now, like my sister's like, you know, oh yeah, no, we still well, I don't follow this person because they fuck with cops. You know what I'm saying? So it's like a small like like. It's like incremental, you know what I'm saying? And I know like, I don't want to make assumptions, but like, I'm sure like the person, the person that asked the question says Steve Colbert. So I already, I like, I racialize them as white, you know? Um, I'm sure like those, quite those conversations get harder because like, you know, um, the illusions for what, for, for like white people who got racialized as white in this country are like deep, 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 deep. You know what I'm saying? And like, um, in different kind of ways, because our our illusions are deep too. You know what I'm saying, like, um, but it's like in a different kind of way. You know what I'm saying. So like, I told myself I wasn't gonna say. You know what I'm saying so many times. Let me shut the fuck up. <laughs> I start flowing. Uh, like, what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. No, that's great. Um, all right, a couple more here. Um, I'm gonna pull this one up first. So, how do you meet them where they are when? Uh, when where they're at is so much there's so much rage involved in what I think is right like someone denying genocide I think that's an important question right now especially with like you know yeah. genocide and Zionism and how freaking widespread Zionism is or like people who just don't care like there's so many people who just like just move through the world and like it's they're just sort of unbothered by what's going on and don't see any I, I don't even think you know, I'm not talking about any specific person or anybody you know, right? But I'm just saying, like, there's people I encounter where, you know, it's just sort of like they, they, they wouldn't even care enough to like say like, oh, well, the U.S. is providing the bombs for this. Like, it's still like somebody else's problem, sort of, is the way yeah. that they think about it. You know, cognitive dissonance is a hell of a drug. That's why I got my phenom shirt on. Um. Here's what I would say to that, you know, um, and like let let other folks, uh, you know, disagree. Maybe you know, they have a different perspective or whatever. But don't fucking beat your head up against a wall, man. Like burnout is real. You're not gonna change somebody's mind who's like determined to believe what they believe. It's like trying to convince a Christian, like of another thing like like christian faith is rooted in the unwaverable like unwavering like uh like it's like un like the more i resist the fact that dinosaurs exist the better christian i am you could put this shit in my face like this bro and it's like nope nope i believe in jesus nope nope I, like why the fuck i want to like waste my energy on that so i just think it's like about working smarter like there are going to be 
some people who just don't want to get it. Let's be optimistic and say yet. But there are people who are on the fence who don't really understand. And that's who we talking to. That's who we want to talk to. You see what I'm saying? Like beating your head up against a wall in some Twitter thread, uh, somebody who's like insistent, man, what kind of projections that person is having? You know what I'm saying? You don't know where their head is at. Like, don't even bother. I understand the rage. I understand. You know what I'm saying? Like, but like, there's a line in the sand for a reason. There is going to be some us and there is going to be some them. We just need to make sure that the us's are, we need to identify who the us's are. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's who you want to talk to. That's who you want to work with. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And I totally agree with that too, by the way, of like, you know, there's people who, th there's a whole range, you know, of folks who you can reach. And then there are people who just will make it quite clear to you that, you know, not don't waste your time. You know? I mean, like, yo, like um, you trying to tell people that Santa Claus don't exist, man. Sometimes people are not ready to understand. Like they just, like you trying it's a, to it, foundation of where they're standing yeah. like the united states is not real like this thing like like what like people don't want to let go of comfort man like they don't want to like sometimes like there's just it's just like that deep like i'll i my all of my references are dated because i'm old but you know you remember in this the matrix when he's like eating the steak and he's like i know this shit ain't real but i don't care i don't want to remember nothing Ignorance is bliss. It's just that. You can't convince that nigga that the steak ain't real. You know what I'm saying? Like, he already knows. So just don't beat your head up against that. Like, this. So, yeah. like, for every one person that you encounter like that, there's, like, 15 that you can actually get somewhere with, you know. Yeah, you're not going to convince the people in the comment section on the New York Post, right? Like that's the uh, there. There's a great conversation that um, Fred Moten had with Sadia Hartman on um, called it's called the the Black Outdoors. It's on YouTube. Folks can find it. And at the end, like somebody asked him a question about like how do you reach people in the comment section of like the local local newspaper who are like, you know, like uh, defending police killings right? right like that the, the people who are like it's justified you know like mm -hmm. um and he said he said you know we those of us who are dog owners he's like we like to convince ourselves that like our dog is like really happy to see us really affectionate towards us like has like deep emotions and thoughts you know and it's like really the dog is just like please take me outside i need to pee like, mm -hmm. please give me some food and some water. Like, I'm hungry. Like, I know you're the person, you're the vehicle for me to get that. And, like, I'm coming to you for this purpose right now. And he's just like, there's some things your dog can't do, you know? And, like, that's the, he was he was using that as a metaphor to describe the guy in the comment section. Like, there's some but things that guy can't do. Like, you know, yeah. and, like, so you have to find, you know, people that, like, that actually, you know, you know it when you, you know, when you can have a conversation with somebody and they don't fully understand, they don't know everything. Like they don't understand the, like you were talking about, I don't know if it was your sister or your mother calling you up, but you know, like they don't, they don't understand all of it, but they're like, this is happening. These flags are going up. What, what do I need to understand about this? Mm -hmm. Right. Like, exactly. you know, and like, so yeah. Um, and good. sometimes I was, okay. Now you go. I was going to say, sometimes I think family is the hardest. Like, I think family in some ways, like, it depends on the type of relationships you have with your family, too. Like, you know, families develop these different antagonisms that are based upon, uh, you know, sibling rivalries or father-son dynamics or things like that. And, like, you can have certain kind of conversations, but often I feel like you're not going to fully convince family in a way that you might be able to with somebody else because of all of the baggage of that relationship, which, and I have good relationships with my family members, but I just know like there's certain things of like, okay, I know where that line is. That's like, that's 
as far as this person is going to be politicized on this specific issue. Mm -hmm. And then maybe in a few years, like we can push it further, but like, you know, I don't know. I just think that about family, but yeah, I just want to say, uh, like uh one thing about the comment section in the new york post like like just to bring it back real quick like in my piece like when like i was talking about the radio station right see like the for the radio is distinct from the new york post it's like i don't know like a comment section is just like equates everything right but like um the idea around maybe flooding the Eric Adams show or like, you know, there's a show called Open Line that is like open discussion and it's usually like really geared towards like uh, public sector union workers, like, right? So I'm like, if we flooded that line, right? Like what is said is like transmitted, right? And you don't know who's listening. And there are some people who are listening who are going to be tight at the shit you're saying. But there are some people who like, ah, oh, I'm not on the fence about that. Who might be able, that we might be able to like flip. You see what I'm saying? Bring to our side or like, you know, clarify shit for, you know what I'm saying? That's different. So I don't know, like it's, it's all different battle lines. Like I mentioned the block times before block times is like a, like a local, uh, people here in the Bronx, you know, a bunch of comrades put together, which like really like is a for us, by us kind of a thing, you know, that like is, I mean, never to the degree, like, you know, at least not yet, we always want to be optimistic, but like, you know, not to the degree of like distribution and shit that a New York Post might have, but, you know, slowly starting to plug this paper in because it's like, you gotta insert a different voice. You gotta insert, you know, we gotta insert that different voice. We got we got to. Otherwise it's just like univocal, it's just one thing. And it doesn't matter if it's Democrat or Republican, we already know this. It doesn't matter because it's it all ends up being the same shit. You know what I'm saying? They it, Like it's still law and order. It's still like anti-immigrant, it's still, you know, Pro genocide. It's still all of these things. Um, so you know, it's not that I'm saying like uh, don't put out a voice and don't emit and don't amplify. I'm not trying to say that. Um, I'm just saying don't get bogged down by a troll. Right. Absolutely. Um, Alex brought up the the Nelly line. I think it was before this was Bill Gates, right? Bill Gates, Donald Trump, let me in now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this I was mean, back earlier on. Right. You're talking about it's aspirations. Right, but I came up in I came up in a hip hop that was like Illuminati got my mind, soul, and my body. Secret society. Yeah. Trying to keep that on me. That shit raised me. I was politicized by the universal Zulu nation. I was Zulu for most of my teenage years. You know what I'm saying? Like, so like the flip for me is stark yeah 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 for sure um so another question here what does liber liberatory pedagogy look like in the classroom for you how do you uh, how do we combat the neoliberal accumulation pressure in academia that's why i ain't got a job now alex <laughs> i'm always doing pe in the class I'm of that Walter Rodney variety, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, I mean, I was an art teacher, but you know, I, I'll give you an example. Like, my art history class was called uh, "The Diaspora Emerges: Filling in the Gaps," and so, like, you know, um, like you know, I would teach surrealism, but then, like, I would, but you know, like, then, like, surrealism is, is not just responding to, like, you know, now nah, I'm gonna be a nerd. Uh, you know, surrealism is not just responding to, you know, the importance of the discovery of like Freud and all of the concepts that he brings to the table, but it's also super anti-colonial, man. Like they're responding to the rift war, you know, and what's going on in Morocco and shit, you know, like they're also like in bed with the negritude movement and Césaire and all of that. So like, and why is this left out? Like, you know, these motherfuckers wrote a, a manifesto called 
murderous humanitarianism where they like align themselves with the colonies on the, and like, you know, with black people on the color question. And that shit was like, of course, in French because it's written in France, but it's like translated into English by Samuel Beckett. And nobody has heard of this shit. Like, it's just not taught, you know? So like, for me as a as an educator, which I think what you're asking is like, like, you know, what am I bringing into the table? I also, you know, I'm, I said Walter Ronnie, but also Moten, man, you know what I'm saying? Like the undercommons, like how are we uh, spitting consciousness in the classroom to literally undermine the structure where it exists? We always on the plantation, you know? So like how is field Negroes are fucking helping to burn this shit down, you know? Um, Shout out to Cooper Union's uh, Students for Justice in Palestine and the Black Student Union. Yeah. Uh, shout out to you. Taught a class with Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Internationalism from, from Below. That was thorough. Oh, was through Hunter College. That's right. Yo, shout out to Ruthie and shout out to all the students that was in that class. It was lit. You know, I, actually, that, that internationalism from below class is like brought me to like think about hip hop from below. And I actually, I mentioned earlier that I wanted to like, kind of like make that distinction because like we talking about hip hop, it, like we're talking about like what got manufactured and regurgitated, but like, what is the spirit of hip hop is like the sample in the remix. It, it's that DIY shit, you know, it's like, what's gen like it's, it's, I mean, hip hop is, we could not even call it that. We could call it just, you know, it, it, it's been so many things throughout throughout time. It's that uh, it's that ability to make something out of nothing, to like uh, uh, to subvert, to undermine, to pull from like all of these different things. That is hip hop to me. It's why like by the time like, you know, the shit goes on TikTok, there's already like the kids on high, in hybrid are already doing something new. You know, we're constantly remaking ourselves constantly. It's it's why like language changes so much. Like, you know, like my slang is, is still very stuck in a certain time period, but I don't understand half the shit these kids saying now. You know what I'm saying? Because we're just the people that have to leave, have to constantly be remaking ourselves. I don't even think we understand it to a degree that like that we're running from the state to some, you know, like that there is that that there is that feeling of it in in there. You know what I'm saying? That we're like because we don't like you know we 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 now understand things so much, unfortunately, through you know like through capitalism that we think everything is like made to be a product, but yeah, at, like if we dial it back, like, you know, I don't know, there's something else. I want to rescue hip hop from it, from, from, from the jaws of the thing, you know? Oh, somebody asked a question. Is there anybody on the underground scene in New York these days that you fuck with? I'm an old lady. I don't know. <laughs> that would be my response. <laughs> I I hope so. You know, I don't really know. I don't. I'm old. I, I still listen to the old shit. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else that we didn't get to that you really wanted to get across? I think we've we've hit the questions. I think unless there's something I missed. I think um, we got. I think we got everything. You know. Right. Please forgive me for the. You know what I'm saying, and you knows because. This is just like I'm gonna look back at this shit and like be like counting how many times I said that shit. But yeah, and like wow. you, know, you know, like again, like um, you know, everything that I'm saying, you know, is, is my own kind of is how I understand shit right now. It's how I think I understand shit. I'm by no means like any expert or anything on any other shit you know what i'm saying uh, I'm, I'm 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 trying to put it together like everybody else is trying to put it together to understand something about my own unfreedom and our unfreedom collectively and so um so it's it's a work in progress it's a uh, you know 
uh, is always is always um, up for for uh, for getting reworked, rethought. Um, it's is it's thinking that is like down to pivot and like make changes and you know what I'm saying because like we gotta we gotta stay open we gotta stay open and and malleable to some degree and so I'm just humbly asking y'all to like see it through that lens in good faith you know yeah well I appreciate everything that you had to say including the ums and you knows and 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 all of that um I think it makes it more I don't know uh it's better. Um, so I guess one thing I'll say before we close out is just that I did say I would come back to this. So Nelson Rockefeller. So we are doing a study group on the tip of the spear that starts on April 17th. Um, it'll be 7.30 p.m. Eastern time every Wednesday until we finish. We'll go through like a chapter at a time, discuss for 90 minutes at a time. Um, folks, that's, that's, um, through our Patreon. Um, but it's not a one, if anybody can't afford the dollar a month or $10 and 80 cents per year, I will waive it for you. Just, um, reach out to me, but, um, you know, otherwise that's, that's what we're asking is that people become patrons of the show to, to access it. But, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be really good. Um, well, if I could just say. And- Plug your shit real quick, man. Like, listen, Tip of the Spear is like the best book I've read in a long fucking time. Like, seriously, like Ori wrote, um, like this is like basic instructions before leaving Earth right here. Like, you want to read this? You want to read this book? It's it's especially like if you like, if you like interested in, if you're thinking about like you know what we got to do on the ground and what came before us, like. It's just really a smart, smart thing. So, like, yeah, do the re- if if I could do the study group, I'm I'm gonna try. We'll see. We would love to have you. Um, yeah, and shout out to the kill the priest slash liquid swords reference there. Um, all right, um, I think we'll leave it there, folks. This has been great. I do want to say one more time. Um, if folks have not watched that interview that you did with that mix, what I like and black power media, I think that folks need to watch that. Um, and you know, we didn't want to rehash that cause we're like, we're not gonna have the same conversation again, but it's an important conversation. Um, and then of course, check out the petition and sign it support. Um, and Shailene, hopefully we can keep this up and have, you know, we'll find more things that I'm sure we can go to you know discuss together and and keep keep a conversation going yeah you know i'm always down all right all right thanks again